nine nuances of the new covenant. What is this about? It's about really getting down to details that matter. You know, we're really good at, as humans at putting things in extremes. We hear a thought, we hear about this new covenant, the dividing line of the cross, we hear about total forgiveness, and next thing you know, we're saying things like, the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. I don't ever need to confess my sins or turn from them because I'm totally forgiven no matter what. We end up taking things to an extreme. If not us, then certainly people out there on the World Wide Web, right? And in the real world itself, we're very good at taking good, solid, scriptural food and then somehow twisting it into misunderstanding and ultimately error. So today we're going to be looking at nine different nuances of the New Covenant message and what the truth is behind each one. So nuance number one, the Old Testament is the inspired Word of God filled with wisdom and insight. Now, how is it that we get this wrong? Well, some people perhaps have taken the idea that the cross is the dividing line between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and therefore only the New Testament matters to us. What the Old Testament has to offer is just a bunch of laws that make no difference to our lives. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, right? The truth is that the Old Testament tells us how we got here. The Old Testament tells us how we ruined the relationship we had with God as we rebelled and walked away and declared ourselves to be Lord of our own ring, drawing a circle around our life experience and saying, forget you, God, we can do this. In fact, we can be like you apart from you. And then, of course, we see God's heart in the matter as he chases after Israel, pursues Israel. You see the passion on his heart. He does whatever he can to reach them and redeem them and save them ultimately through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so the Old Testament is a story of rebellion and rescue. And it also offers us incredible wisdom. As you look through the Proverbs, you see incredible wisdom there. As you look through the Psalms, you see the heart of David there. A man after God's own heart. There is so much richness and depth in the Old Testament. We would be foolish to utterly neglect it, to disregard it, or to call it lesser. Are there 613 laws in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Are we under those laws? No way. But there is still an incredible amount of usefulness in teaching from the Old Testament and, and understanding it and reading it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 puts it this way, all Scripture... Now, when this was written, guess what was also written? The Old Testament was complete at this point. Paul says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So, does this mean that we're under everything in the Old Testament? No. But it means that every ounce of the Old Testament is worth talking about, worth teaching. But I guess the question is, what are we going to teach about it, right? Are we going to ignore the new in teaching the old? Are we going to teach the old as if that's the end of the story? It's not the end of the story. Remember, there's a surprise ending in the cross and the resurrection and because of those events, we're dead to the law and free from the law. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is always the same. The covenant has changed, but our God has not. Now, if we can wrap our minds around that, we have an important nuance that is significant to our spiritual lives. That God has always been the same, even though the covenant 
that we are under has certainly changed. We're under a new covenant, not the old covenant. We're under God's grace, not under the law. But it is the same God in the old and the new. Early on in the church, there were heretics teaching two gods. The God of the old and the God of the new. That is a significant error, a heresy. We must embrace the fact that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But fortunately for us, we are blessed to live on this side of the cross under a new covenant. We've got a better deal. What Hebrews says is a better covenant, a superior covenant founded on better promises. So don't let someone twist our words. Don't get it wrong in your mind thinking that somehow the Old Testament is irrelevant or not helpful. It is the inspired Word of God filled with His wisdom. Do we need to use discernment in reading the Old Testament? Uh, you better believe it. As I've often said, put on those new covenant glasses when you're reading the Old Testament. You know, I said that Proverbs is filled with wisdom. Sometimes, though, Solomon will talk about the law of the Lord and how he needs to meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. And then we read in the New Testament that we are not under the law, that we are dead to the law. So should we be meditating on the law day and night as New Covenant believers? No, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ the author and perfecter of our faith, not fixing our eyes on what Moses delivered coming down that mountain. Read the Old Testament, but put your New Testament glasses on every single time. All right, nuance number two. The Gentile was never officially given the law to start with, but the righteous requirements of the law are still written on the Gentile conscience. A very important nuance. Otherwise, we get off the reservation, we get off the tracks in our thinking, we start saying, well, you know, because the Gentile, and that's me, and that's likely you, because the Gentile was never given the law in the Old Testament, then every verse about being dead to the law is irrelevant to us. Every verse about not being under the law is completely unrelated to us. And we begin to dismiss Paul's teaching on freedom from the law because we say, well, I'm a Gentile, so those verses don't apply to me anyway. Well, remember that Paul is writing Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Romans about this freedom from the law. The law is more than Moses and Judaism. The law is a mentality. Colossians 2 talks about this mentality being rule-based. If you've died to the principles and rules of this world, then why do you submit to those rules? Do not taste, do not handle, do not touch. These have an appearance of wisdom, but they won't do anything to stop sin. So there's more to a law-based attitude than just Moses. And what we see here in Romans chapter 2 is this. The Gentiles, for most of us, that's us. The Gentiles who do not have the law, when they do instinctively the things of the law, that is, show morality and ethics instead of immorality, they are a law to themselves even though they don't have the law, in that they show, here it comes, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or defending them, depending on how they've been doing lately. So what does this tell you? We didn't have Moses, perhaps. We didn't grow up in the lineage and the heritage and the bloodline that would make us Israelites and so, therefore, we don't officially have the law even to start with. Nevertheless, something shows us our spiritual death. Something shows us our need for Christ, right? We saw our need for Christ. We became aware of our sin, and we became aware of our spiritual death. How did we get that awareness? 
If it wasn't the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone, specifically if you had never studied Moses and yet you came to Christ, if it was not the law in the Old Testament that caused you to be convicted, to recognize your unbelief and your need for Jesus, then what was it as a Gentile that caused you to come to this awareness? The Bible is saying that it was our heart and our conscience. The heart and the conscience has the righteous requirements of the law written there, branded there, inscribed there, so that no one has an excuse. And so the point of this then is that as a Gentile believer, as a Roman who came to Christ, as a Philippian who came to Christ, as a Galatian who came to Christ, you were freed from something. You were freed from your conscience that was killing you. We were either under the condemnation of the law as a Jew, or we were under the condemnation of the conscience as a Gentile. And either way, Jesus Christ frees us from that condemnation. So then, should you merely follow your conscience today? Well, you can see then that that's not necessarily where we should go all the time. The unbeliever has a conscience. The believer has a conscience. Watch out for your conscience. Your conscience may not be properly programmed. Have you ever thought about that? There are many people who are in Christ and their conscience goes off when it shouldn't. It's called legalism. We're at a wedding and they offer dancing at the wedding. And so we put our foot out on the dance floor and all of a sudden the conscience says, boo, 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 thou shalt not dance. <laughs> now, I should probably not dance. <laughs> if you've seen me dance, you would know what I mean. But nevertheless, the conscience can be programmed by anything. That's my point. And so ultimately, we need our conscience programmed by the gospel, the conscience programmed by the blood of Jesus, the conscience programmed by the truth of our righteousness so that we recognize our freedom in Christ and we don't just run around like an unbeliever obeying our conscience that was programmed by the Bible Belt, by the United States uh, version of Christianity, by whatever mom and dad taught us, by whatever we heard in church, We'd better test things against the Word of God and trust the Spirit over time to reprogram our conscience. Does God work through the conscience still? Absolutely. The Bible talks about the conscience, but it also says, let your conscience be clean or sprinkled clean because of the blood of Jesus. Don't let your conscience kill you. You've been freed from your conscience. You've been freed from the condemnation of the law because that law was inscribed on your conscience as an unbeliever. And now we have a new way to live, not merely by conscience, but by the Word and by the Spirit of God living in us. Do you see that? God is greater than our conscience. Our conscience doesn't always tell us truth. Nuance number three. Only some of Jesus' teachings before the cross are designed to show the true spirit of the law. This is so important because people get out their Sharpie magic marker. You know, they'll go by the big one with the wide blade on it. And they'll draw a line right there at the cross. And they'll say, see, everything that Jesus said before this line is old covenant law based, not for us. It's totally irrelevant. We should just disregard it. That is not what we teach. That is not what we're saying. Do you recognize that before that dividing line of the cross, there are many things that are prophecies about what's going to come. Relationship with the Holy Spirit. I in you and you in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What's he talking about? He's talking about something that's coming after the cross. When is he talking about it? He's talking about it before the cross. So our little Sharpie marker and us trying to make the Bible into a math problem with a line down it, this is not geometry. This is spiritual truth. And so we have to recognize that Jesus is bigger than any sort of system or box that we want to try to put the Scriptures into. Jesus is bigger than that. 
Sometimes he's talking about a future relationship that is right around the corner. Sometimes he's burying people under the Jewish system that they're under. He's saying, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, be perfect. Get right with your brother before you go give your animal sacrifice. Matthew 5, go get right with your brother before you give your animal sacrifice. Clearly, what is that? Let's apply a bit of common sense as we look at, for example, the Sermon on the Mount. You'll be answerable to the Sanhedrin. Who was answerable to the Sanhedrin? The Jews. Do you hang out with the Sanhedrin on weekends? I don't. I haven't seen them in a while. Have you given an animal sacrifice lately? I haven't. I haven't seen you do one in a while. So it's not rocket science when we see him addressing Jewish people about Jewish issues. But then he turns around and talks about I and you and you and me and I will bring to remembrance everything that I want you to know and I will live in you and you will live from me and apart from me you can do nothing. And here's what the kingdom of God is like and here's what the kingdom of heaven is like and this is what my return will be like. Do we see the teachings of Jesus are comprehensive and big and they don't fit in one little box called Old Covenant or New Covenant? What a revelation it is to discover that sometimes Jesus is exposing the true spirit of the law. I mean, it's a big, important revelation. It keeps us from cutting off body parts because we recognize his purpose. It keeps us out of the amputation ward at the local hospital. It helps us see that he was raising the bar to a be perfect, just like God standard so that their hearts would sink and they would get that little gulp here and they wouldn't know what to do. And that was the whole point. And what a revelation that is because it frees us. It's one thing to be freed from Moses. It's another thing to be freed from Moses on steroids. Jesus brought us Moses on steroids. Jesus brought us Moses 2.0. It's good to be freed from Moses. You had better understand how to be freed from the true spirit of the law. That'll really kill you. You think the law kills you. The true spirit of the law really kills you. And that's what Jesus was saying. That was his whole point. And what a revelation that is. But then, after that revelation, what a travesty it would be the, to then pick up all of Jesus' teachings out of context, regardless of audience or purpose, and dump them in the same bin and say, well, that's all Old Covenant. There are people doing this, and we shouldn't. The words of Jesus Christ and His teachings are bigger than that. They deserve more respect than that. Amen? Galatians 4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus was born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. How did he do it? Two ways. How did he redeem people who were under the law? A, he showed them their current problem. That's the true spirit of the law. Good luck with that. This is your current issue. There's no way you can do it, but go ahead and try if you want. Here's the standard. No, wait, here's the standard. No, actually, the standard is all the way up here. Good luck. That's the first thing he did. And the second thing he did is, oh, by the way, there's a better way coming. Oh, by the way, it's going to be me and you and you and me. It's going to be a union. You're going to live for me, and I've got this. I've got this. It's all going to be free. And as he did this dance, you see, he, he should dance. You see, he does, does this dance between burying people and exposing a new way, between nails in the coffin of the old way, and then prophesying about something right around the corner. As he does this, they'll eventually, not right away, they'll eventually get it. And then we see this New Testament message go forth. The writings of Paul, Peter, James, and John, not one of us is telling us to... Not one of them is telling us to pluck out our eyes, cut off our hands, or to sell everything in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nuance number four. We still admit wrongdoing, turn from it, and confess our struggles to trusted friends, even though God has already forgiven us. Somewhere, though, 
people, I don't know if it's just we want to grow callous to the Word of God. We want to hibernate in a hole. We don't want to be transparent with people. We, we would rather hide in shame and guilt rather than find somebody to talk to. We're all human and we can gravitate toward these attitudes absolutely. But the Bible's pretty clear. In fact, it's a bit ironic because here's the thing. We can talk to one another with confidence because God has already forgiven us. See, if God has fully forgiven you and God has fully forgiven me, then why can't we talk? You see that? I mean, what am I afraid of? I might be afraid of your criticism, so I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to somebody else. That's what I'm going to do. Find a trusted friend. Here it's, you see it in James 5. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So that you can be healed. Is that about somebody coming up on stage? Be healed. Is that physical healing? No, that's not the context. The context is, I'm in a struggle. I'm hurting. I need healing. What kind of healing? Well, I need psychological healing, emotional healing, soul healing. I need to know the truth. And I need encouragement and I need prayer. And I'm telling you what's going on with me. And I'm asking you, please, please, would you pray for me? Now, this has nothing to do with us being totally forgiven. Us being totally forgiven is clear. We are forgiven past, present, and future. So somehow the, the baby gets tossed out with the bathwater, as they say, right? Right? Let's not toss out repentance or turning from sin. Let's not toss out admitting our wrongdoing or confessing to one another. And certainly, let's not toss out the simple, straightforward fact that you are a completely forgiven person. I'll see, uh, here's where our, our wires get crossed. We, our wires get crossed with the words, in order to. See, I thought I had to confess in order to be forgiven. I thought I had to repent in order to be forgiven. We put in order to, and Jesus says the cross already happened. We say in order to, and he says it's finished. We say in order to, and he says it's once for all. So we need to say it's once for all, and thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is awesome. And now, for the sake of relationship and transparency, I'm just going to be real with people. And ask for prayer. And it has nothing to do with our forgiveness. You see that? Nuance number five. The Holy Spirit still disciplines us and counsels us and guides us into all truth while not treating us like convicts. Years ago, in my first book, The Naked Gospel, in 2009, I pointed out that the Bible actually says the Holy Spirit convicts the world because of their unbelief in Jesus. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He convicts the world of sin because they do not believe in me, Jesus said. So from there I said, you know, we toss around this word con convict. We toss it around as if we're convicts. And so the idea, oh, yeah, Jesus took my sins away, but the Holy Spirit sure is convicting me. Jesus took my sins away, but God sure is convicting me. And we use this word convict very loosely. And a lot of people imagine the Holy Spirit's going to give us a guilt trip and shame us into submission. Now, it's important then to understand that God does not treat us as convicts. The word convict is typically reserved for a criminal who is awaiting trial, and when they're convicted, they end up undergoing punishment. Is there any punishment for us? No. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So what a revelation it is to understand what Hebrews says. Here's what Hebrews says. Hebrews says, God remembers our sins no more. And then it says, get this now, this is cool. It says, and the Holy Spirit also testifies... Their sins and lawless acts I remember no more. So the Holy Spirit has chosen to forget your sins. Not just Jesus. 
Not just God the Father, but the Holy Spirit is chosen to not take into account our sins. In other words, the entire Trinity is on the same page. <laughs> and the entire Trinity has forgiven us. And the entire Trinity is pleased to have us. So we say, amen, I get it. He is not beating us over the head. He is not condemning us. So therefore, there's no discipline. There's no guidance. There's no counsel. He just, you know, behavior doesn't matter. You know, he just cares about belief. So, you know, whenever we do something, we punch somebody across the face. That's just a deed. That's an action. He doesn't care about that. He's just interested in our belief. So we separate belief and deeds, and we have this cute little dance we do where he, we say he's concerned about this, but not about this. The Bible is filled with behavior passages. The Bible is filled with places in the New Testament that talk about our conduct, our speech, the way that we treat other people, building them up or tearing them down. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, we should be craving the discipline of the Lord. But the problem is I've got it confused with dad and mom's discipline, right? They weren't perfect. They're humans just like us. And maybe mom and dad messed up in some ways. Maybe they didn't handle themselves perfectly. Maybe you walked away from an abusive situation leaving that home. I don't know your situation, but we, whether it's a church experience or family experience or trouble with, with parents who were abusive, we get the idea that discipline is somehow going to be abusive. And the Bible is showing us that discipline is just training for the future, not punishment for the past. And so he's saying we need to crave it. Do you crave the discipline of the Lord? Do you know that this is the same word that comes from the word disciple? You know, Jesus had disciples. How did he treat them? He walked with them. He mentored them. He molded them. He shaped them. He invested in them. Now imagine how much more with Christ living in you, what is it like to be discipled by the indwelling Christ? And so this is what makes us legitimate children because it's evidence that God cares about us and invests in us. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good, so that we may share His holiness. I know that reading a passage like this, the word discipline can mean ten things to ten different people. But I guess I'm hoping that you see, number one, God is good our Father is good. And he, you know what he says in the book of Ephesians? He says to other fathers, he says, don't provoke them to anger. Don't provoke your children to anger and don't exasperate them. Get this. Don't exasperate your children, but instead bring them up in the training of the Lord. What does that tell you? The training of the Lord does not exasperate you. Pretty cool, huh? Have you ever had a life coach? who said, I am going to take no record of anything you ever do wrong. I'm going to train you for the future, but I'm not going to bash you about the past. I'm going to equip you for tomorrow, but I'm not going to condemn you for yesterday. I'm going to live with you in the present, and I am going to be your everything, mold and shape, and invest in you. There's going to be no guilt and no shame and no condemnation to it. It's all about today and being equipped for tomorrow because I care so deeply about you. With that, I ask you, will you crave the discipline of the Lord? He disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness, so that our attitudes and actions are set apart just like we are. Nuance number six, the law is not dead or gone. It is still a tool for unbelievers so that they can see their need for salvation by grace through faith. Somewhere along the line we hear, I'm dead to the law. Whoa, never heard that. 
I'm free from the law. Whoa, this is awesome. Christ is the end of the law for who? For those who believe. And then somehow we twist it into, uh, did y'all hear the cool message? The law's dead. Law's gone. Law's dead. Law's gone. Law is, is totally non-existent. Not the case. Not the case. There is a big difference between saying the law is dead and then instead the truth that we as believers died to the law. See, that's the rescue we got. We need to be bragging about the stringency of the law because that's why Jesus needed to free us from it. 1 Timothy 1, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person. Who's it made for? For those who are lawless and rebellious. When was this written? Who is this writing? The Apostle Paul, after the cross, writing a young pastor under the new covenant. He is saying, young pastor Tim, let me tell you, the law still serves a purpose. It can drive your Jewish friends and the conscience can drive your Gentile friends. It can drive people to see their need for Christ. And without that tool of the conscience and the law, how would people ever recognize their spiritual death and their need for life? The law is not dead, but we've died to the law. That's the rescue we received. Nuance number seven, even though... We are not the source of temptation. Believers still commit sins and still participate and are responsible for their choices. I hope this seems like a no-brainer to you. I hope you're like, well, duh, to a few of these at least. But the reality is there are people out there. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them wackos. Okay? Yeah, wackos. And they're saying, this is what these wackos are saying. They're saying, because I'm a believer, I don't ever sin again. I don't ever commit sins ever again. And they're giving Christ a bad name because then we're living in la-la land and you just want to say to them, really, you never sin? You never sin. Could I interview your wife? <laughs> Let me just ask her, right? Because the bottom line is there's plenty of places. There's plenty of places in the New Testament that tell us that we still commit sins. We participate. We choose. This is why Romans 6 says, therefore, now that you're saved, now that you're a new creation, do not let sin reign. Are you the source of temptation? No. It's important to know that. Again, that's the big revelation here. I'm not the source of temptation. My heart is not desperately wicked. I'm not a dirty worm. I'm not a rotten sinner. You are holy and righteous and blameless and you're a saint and you've got a new heart and a new spirit and a new nature and you're one with Christ. And so sinful thoughts do not emanate from your core. You are not the source of temptation. And that's an awesome revelation. Still, though, there's a choice. Don't let the parasite reign. Don't let the parasite called sin reign in your mortal body. Don't obey whose lusts? Its lusts. They're not your lusts, but we're still responsible. Don't let the parasite win. Recognize the ploy. Recognize the strategy. Say no to sin. Say yes to Jesus. Don't obey its lusts. Don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So does it sound like passivity? It is not passivity. There are active choices we make every moment, right? And so this is why... Paul tells us we do still commit sins. People try to play a little shell game. Oh, well, we're not under the law and sin's not imputed if there is no law. So therefore, I never sin because I'm not under the law. No, in Christ, there's a new definition of sin. In Christ, the new definition of sin is this. Anything that is not of faith is sin. It's dependency on Him that is the goal. And when we don't depend on Him, it's sin. So... 
Nuance number eight, even though our spirit is where the core transformation took place within us, our soul and body are fully acceptable to God too. He loves all of us. I grew up with the misconception. I heard, man, you got a new spirit. You got a new spiritual heart. You got a new spiritual core. Therefore, that's great, but the rest of you is dirty. Okay? I was told, don't believe in old self, new self battles. It's not your old self versus your new self. It's not the schizophrenic Christianity. It's not you being two people. You're one person. You're a new creation at the core. You're a new creation only in your spirit. You're a new creation at the center of your being. But psst, the rest of you is filthy. And so you need to get cleaned up over time. Your soul is like a dark hole and your spirit is going to cast a little more light each day and eventually that darkened soul is going to be lightened again. And so I had a weird theology. I was one of the wackos. And I had a weird theology. And it was basically this. On one hand, I'd say, yes, your spirit is sealed. Maybe you can relate to this. Yes, your spirit is sealed until the day of redemption. Your spirit is new and you are one with the Lord, one spirit with Him. You're new at the core. Oh, and by the way, you know, Romans says this. It says your body is holy and acceptable to Him too. But let me tell you about your soul. Your soul is a darkened, black, sinful hole. So now I've got a sandwich on my hands. You see, my spirit is acceptable to him. Holy, righteous, acceptable, blameless. My body, holy and acceptable. Romans 12.1, which we'll see in a second. Here it is. Romans 12.1. Therefore, your bodies can be a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. But still, you see... I had the spirit going, oh yeah, spirit's new, spirit's righteous, spirit's holy. The body, oh yeah, the body's holy and acceptable. It's a tool, it's an instrument of God, the, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. But then right here in the middle, the soul, man, that's hideous to God. And I hadn't figured it out. I mean, I guess when he picks me up for heaven, you know, when I get up to the pearly gates, he's going to reach inside that sandwich, get to the soul and kind of rub it off like a bowling ball, maybe polish it a little bit or replace it in heaven. I'll get a new soul in heaven or something. You see, I had caught hold of a few diagrams, spirit, soul, and body. And then in my mind, I had categorized which parts God accepts and which parts God rejects in their current state. And what a revelation it was to see, you know what? I don't, I'm not seeing any diagrams in the Word of God here. He's just saying, you are holy. Not a compartment of you. You are holy. You are blameless. Not a compartment of you. You are blameless and you are holy. And you are my child, he would say. You are a saint. You are righteous. Not a compartment of you. So diagrams can be great tools, but they also have limits. You're a person, not a circle. You're a person, not a diagram or a chart. Nuance number nine. Even though Christ lives in us and wants to express himself through us, we participate and make active choices. We aren't to be passive. Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. That's something about eagles and wings. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what. I'm, I'm starving. I don't have a job and I'm not really looking, but I'm just waiting for that eagle. Don't wait for the eagle. You've got Christ living in you. You don't need to be passive. Hebrews 12 is not passive. Paul says, I labor and I strive according to the power that works within me. Hebrews 12 says this, We have a great cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Does that sound like God's up in heaven going, I sure hope she doesn't make a move. I sure hope she doesn't make a choice or a move because that would be so intimidating to me. I wouldn't know what. And so we've got this small God. We're walking on eggshells. We're afraid to choose because it's got to be all of him and none of me. 
And that is passivity. It is all of you and all of Christ together in a beautiful union. God is big. If he wants something different, he will show you. It will be plain and obvious. But you don't have to be reading the tea leaves, opening the fortune cookies every day, trying to get revelation from secret messages so that you can make a choice so that then you won't be blaming God because it was God's choice, not mine. Well, sometimes we don't know what's best. Maybe there is no best. And we have to choose with our brains and our minds and the wisdom God has given us. So we pray for wisdom, but sometimes there's no skywriting. There's no electric neon sign. And so we have to walk by faith, not by feeling and not by secret messages. Are you willing to not know? Are you willing to not know the exact thing you're supposed to do and instead recognize you're righteous no matter what you choose and that you're going to learn and grow from it no matter what you choose and no matter what door you walk through, God will be on the other side of that too because Christ lives in us. Let us lay aside every encumbrance that's active, not passive. Let us run the race that is active, not passive, let us fix our eyes on Jesus as we're doing it. So I'm fixing my eyes on him and I'm trusting him, but I'm running like crazy because I want to win. And guess what? We all win. We're all overcomers because of the blood of Jesus and because of our testimony about him, Revelation says. We all win. But let's run like crazy, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And I'm not talking about religious effort. I'm talking about running by faith. But it's not boring. That's my point. It's not boring. It's not passive. It's active. What do we see today? Nine nuances that can make all the difference. Let's thank our God. Father, we thank you for the new covenant. We thank you for this powerful covenant that is unchanging, that we are locked in. We thank you for the power of your indestructible life that secures our salvation forever. We thank you that you haven't left us bored out of our skulls, but instead we get to be active, trusting you, running a race, throwing off every sin that entangles, fixing our eyes, counting ourselves dead to sin and alive to you. We thank you, Father, that it's not about rules. It's about letting you rule. It's not about principles. It's about a person. It's about you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.